Howdy hackers and welcome to another episode of Fairlight TV. We have touched up on demos before, but this episode is going to be more of a deep dive into that. It's not going to be sort of a super deep technical analysis of demos, but I will browse through a few of my early favorite demos and, and explain a few of the demo effects in them. Uh, given that I'm not a demo coder, there might be aspects that I didn't get right, but uh, we will probably have comments from people down below who believe that they understand it better and, and would have uh, ways to explain it, which might be better than mine. So uh, these are rather old demos, all of them. And the reason is that current modern demos are more thematic. It's, it's a constant flow where the the action of the demo goes and there is a, like a line of thought that is developing during the demo. Uh, back in the days you would have more parts, I mean individual parts that were separate executable files and when that one was done or when you kind of perceive that you've seen it you would press space and go on. That's also one of the habits from uh, from copy parties back then that uh, when people thought that they have seen enough of a demo part, they would yell space so that the organizers would press space and go on to the next uh, the next part in a demo. That rarely happens today because I mean, pressing space doesn't do anything uh, because the demo keeps continuing and you can't kind of forward it uh, because space wouldn't be uh, like relevant input. Uh, so, uh, that was me resetting the C64, uh, we will get to that. Um, I, I need to, to, to explain a bit uh, about how the C64 works. And, uh, I mean, all displays are sort of drawn line by line. There is a, a raster beam that paints every line. And then there is some sort of mechanism inside the computer that makes it possible for, uh, well, kind of makes up the data that the raster line will be drawing. Uh, but, but think of it like painting lines. You have a horizontal blank where the, the line is painted fully and then it wraps around to start the next one. And then you have a vertical blank where it's painted the last line and starts on the first one. So there, there is one thing you should know about the C64 here is it, there, there is a, a, a PAL version that's done for the European TV system and there is also an NTSC one done for the American uh, TV system. Uh, and they are sort of different because the TV standards are different. The, the, uh, the PAL one has more lines and all lines are 63 cycles or yeah, so that's the number of CPU cycle it takes to paint one line. Whereas there are actually two NTSC ones and they are different. I, I think one of them is 64 and one potentially 65. Well, the, the key part is that they are different. So that means that if you code a demo that is reliant on, on specific exact timing, uh, you would need to make two versions, one for PAL and one for NTSC, unless you sort of make it possible to adjust according to that. Most of the intros for cracks, they are adjusting so that uh, they work both on NTSC and Palm, on PAL. But, but if you look at demos, they are typically not uh, able to run in any other system than, than what they are written for. And given how the, the market looks today, most of them are, are PAL demos. I, it, it's been a long time since I saw a relevant NTSC demo last. Uh, well, that was that. So uh, one little aspect as well of the C64 is that um, you have the border. Uh, so that's, that's one thing. So the screen is, of course, uh, all of it, the, the entire screen, including the border. Whereas uh, you have this thing inside the border, which is sort of also reference screen. So if I talk about screen, I might mean the entire thing. And I can also mean only the, the thing inside the border. So if we're just addressing the thing inside the border, it has 40 times 25 characters. 
uh, and a character is a block or a cell of eight times eight pixels. So a character row, it's 40 times eight pixels. Okay. Uh, the VIC and the CPU, they are sharing the same bus. Uh, that means that uh, when the VIC needs to read from memory, it takes precedence over the, the CPU. So the CPU just halts and, and awaits the VIC to do its work and then hands it back. On the Amiga, you have the chip mem and the fast mem. And uh, so chip mem is sort of the same thing where, where both the, the, uh, the support chips of the machine and the CPU are sharing the bus, whereas fast mem means is, is something that can only be addressed by the, by the CPU. We don't have any fast mem on the C64. Everything is sort of chip mem. Uh, but that means that on the start of every character line, the VIC steps in to read character pointers. Uh, so it sort of reads the, the, the information it needs for generating the output. So it steals, out of the 63 PAL cycles, it steals 40 of them. So a bad line, that's what you call the first line there, only, um, you only have like 23 cycles left for whatever you like to do. If you also add sprites, the individual elements that you can place anywhere you want on the screen, then uh, the first one steals an additional three cycles, but then they steal two cycles each. So if you make something cycle exact, and then you move sprites around, that is a key challenge because depending on the position of the sprite, it could take uh, a few of the cycles from uh, from your routine or not. So you need to take that into account as well. These are just a few of the aspects of, of coding demos that are really interesting. And then you're working in a very constrained environment with only 64K to actually execute what you want. So my ambition now is that we should take a look at a few demos uh, and we should move over to this. My first, uh, the first demo I would like to show you is Think Twice One. And I'm running Vice, uh, the, um, yeah, I could possibly also show you this. No, ah, oh, you don't see that. So this is running uh, Vice 3.6. It's the SC, which means it's the most, the more cycle exact uh, emulator. You, there is the, the plain X64, which is less exact, and, and that's not automatically built anymore in the in the newer Vice builds. But uh, yeah, but I build it myself, so I build both, but this is using the SC, so the same as uh, the one as uh, if you download it from somewhere. So let's run Think Twice One. And I'll just pause it there. That's also one of the beauties of, of running it you know, via an emulator. What you see here is the effect called FLD, flexible line distance. Uh, when I talked about the bad lines, uh, that is reading the, the character line, the uh, eight times 40 uh, raster uh, or, or pixels. What you can do is just before reading the next bad line, if you fiddle with the scroll registers, you can ensure that the, the rust line does not reach or the VIC doesn't reach the, the bad line on the next one. You just kind of push that forward. So ensuring it's never hitting uh, the condition that, well, I should now have a bad line. Then FLD happens. So you can push the entire screen downwards by, by sort of inserting uh, a value there. And, and you can do it, as, do it as long as you like. So you can basically push the entire screen out. That's sort of the, the, the most simple thing. If, if you have a big bitmap, you push it down and then you could have it float inwards uh, and then you would show the screen. But here uh, they have, they are ensured that they insert the FLD effect between each character line. So this is the bouncing thing we see here.
Should we now trash it? Yes. I'm going to pick the antenna cable out soon. Just be ready for that. I picked the antenna cable out. No, that is the internal joke. Uh, when I first saw this demo, this was uh, Greyhawk showing it to me. And he was fiddling with his computer like he pretended he pulled out the antenna. This is a demo effect. And what you see here is something called ESCOS, um, extended screen, whatever, whatever, whatever. It was a, uh, This is a routine that was invented by the guys in 1001 crew, uh, Dutch, totally brilliant guys in, I think this is in 87. Uh, so what you can do with the C64 is, uh, you can't place sprites uh, visibly outside in the border area unless you find some sort of trick where you make them visible because the, the border is overlaying everything. So you need to fool the Vic to show the sprites rather than showing the border. And the way you do it, uh, I hope you see this. So think of the, of the screen. Now we're talking upper and lower because that is sort of the easier part. Uh, you, you can set the screen height between 25 and 24. Okay, so you set it to 25, the, uh, and I'm now illustrating the 25th row. So you have it, roster is drawing, and roster is drawing, and when it's drawing something in on one of those eight lines, where uh, on the 25th line, uh, you are still painting the screen, the inside between, inside the border. And then you do 24. So that line disappears, which means that Vic would never reach the position where uh, it will get the signal that border should start. And when it's drawn beyond like the lower part, you can turn it to 25 again. So that's everything you need to know. And suddenly you don't have any border, upper or lower. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so upper or lower, they, they disappear by this trick. I hope that was sort of clear what that was. The, the other thing you can do, and, and the preciseness of this is, well, you can be really sloppy and it still works because you have 63 times eight, basically, cycles to, to poke, uh, and then you need to wait, and then you just poke again. So it's it's a, rather simple trick once you know how to fool the Vic to do it. The more difficult trick is doing it on the side uh, because then uh, because the, the screen is, is is 40 characters and then you need you could you could set it to 38 but then you have uh, one characters on that dimension. So when the roster goes into this little area, so still drawing screen, you need to do from 40 and you need to set it to 38. And then, well, then it continues painting, painting into the border and then you set it to 40 again. So it's 40 on the next lap. And then you need to do that on every raster line. So it's quite a lot more difficult to do it in the sides because you need to have a perfectly stable raster interrupt to hit that one cycle precise position where you should uh, go from from uh, 40 to 38 and then you do that for the entire screen and what you can then do is something like this and this is something called esco so this extended screen whatever whatever filling the screen with sprites so welcome to think twice blew my mind So what you see here is just another expose of, of FLD. This is super nice music as well by Red. And uh, I guess White was the one doing code. And he was humble enough to tell it uh, in, the, in the header of it. And uh, there, is always, there is also this nice uh, kind of sparkling little uh, maggots crawling around the characters. We can have a little look at that. That's, I mean... That's not a Vic trick, that's just uh, super nice.
<laughs> yes. Think Twice won by the judges. Totally stunning. Totally stunning. What you saw on the Escos part was that they didn't have the screen on because they didn't want to fiddle with the with this uh, this uh, the screen pointers the uh, the bad lines. Uh, so you could turn the screen off and and still do the trick. Uh, I, I'm not going to go through it, but that is the the easier way of doing it. Combining graphics inside the border and also sprites outside the border. That's when you also have the issue of of taking into account the 2023 20, uh the, the bad lines basically let's let's bump to the next one uh, this is also the judges and this is think twice five I mean, this is not adding anything else than what you already saw in Think Twice One, but uh, this is full a scrolling set of sprites that runs in in all of the borders. Um, yes, so one with white and one with cocoa. Yes, and so we press F three here. So here you have graphics inside the screen and then border, uh, sprites in the border, making a, a rather stunning composition that totally breaks away from the borders you saw before. And now we press F5. I mean, in theory, this is the same. It's a bit more complex because it's adding scrolling to it, but... Uh, And then he had enough cycles to add another sprite, so now he's using one uh, a sprite to add a scroller to it. In 1987. Cool guys, absolutely cool guys. Um, yes, so the next one here is uh, Bonanza. MDT. Uh, yeah, well, um... Boogaloo, uh, Linus Nielsen is one of the guys being responsible for this. And this was uh, also... Oops. It's not supposed to do that. It's really not supposed to do that. Uh, yeah, let's see if it... Okay, this is how it's going to be. So here you see the same thing. It's the epic loading screen of Druid. Um, and then also uh, graphics using sprites in the border. So here you see them uh, filling the entire border and also playing music at the same time, which is also quite... It's a bit of a challenge because uh, when, you, when you open the border, you need to be in full control and you can't hand over the control to a music routine because you don't know exactly how many cycles a music routine will take. And, and given that opening the border needs to be cycle exact, uh, you, n you need to ensure that you have enough roster space left on every screen to also play the, uh, play the music. And this is why um, yeah, music in routines where they... Um, Music in in uh, in demo parts that consume a lot of the roster time, then then the music would have very little roster time left. So uh, there are a number of tunes like Lazy Jones that consume very little memory and also very little roster time, and they are really popular. Or or back in the eighties, they were really popular to use when you had very little roster time over. Yes, we can fast forward. That's also one of the beauties of emulation. So running samples, and this is uh, something which was also rather new at the time. 
they are now running seven sprites on top of graphics. Um, and I haven't looked into how they do this, but uh, I mean, it, it's not trivial to do that. It might not look that impressive to you if you haven't tried to code it yourself, but seven sprites on top of graphics, that takes a bit of thinking. Sorry, shouldn't warp mode, I should pause. So, what you see on the screen, it's clearly bitmap mode, and moving bitmap, you really can't do it. I mean, not this fast. So there needs to be some sort of trick that allows you to move bitmap, because uh, it, most of the games that you see, they are done in character mode, and moving character means that every block of eight times eight pixel you only need to move one byte, which is convenient because that is sort of the reference to the character. But if you if you're using bitmap mode, you need to check. You need to actually move all like 64 bits. You need to that that's copying eight bytes plus character byte. Uh, sorry, color bytes as well. So you basically need to to copy. Uh, what would that be like? Ten bytes for every eight times eight and given how little time you have on every frame you cannot do it and this is clearly doing it so they need to have some sort of trick and the trick here is something called vsp virtual screen positioning and to the best of my knowledge they're also applying something called line crunch so vsp means that you fiddle with the screen pointer uh, with the uh, on on the, on the bad line, you fiddle with uh, when the bad line actually happened, the detection of when bad line happens. That means that you can move the entire screen. Um, so the VIC basically starts reading the screen at the middle of the bad line rather than normally like in the beginning. So that, that is VSP. And then line crunch is, is forcing a new read of uh, forcing a new bad line basically at the start of every um, every raster line, which means that what normally would have been eight pixels, uh, sorry, <laughs> one pixel row, uh, so no, what would be eight pixels row? You squeeze that into only one because you it you you paint the first row and then it starts to paint the first row on the next line. So you can basically kind of shrink the entire screen into the, the first line of every uh, character line. If you combine that, you can position the screen as you want. And, and basically, you also need to ensure that all the lines you're drawing there are black. Otherwise, it would be a, sort of a compacted little screen you would see at the beginning. And, and you don't see that here. So they are doing something to cover that. But uh, so this is VSP and line crunch. Uh, yeah, and sorry for being sort of sloppy in the explanation here. I'm sure demo guys would be more specific, but uh, if you're just uh, watching this and you're not demo coding, this would probably help you sort of appreciating the uh, the technical knowledge of the guys doing the demos. That's that's the entire point. Yeah. Very nice. MDT. Uh, Jürgen and Linus, they both joined uh, Horizon after this uh, because the guys from Horizon were really amazed by this demo and, and really couldn't figure out how it worked. So uh, they were really quick to recruit them after seeing what they could do. Uh, yes, I only have one additional demo, um, which is this. 
panoramic design, uh, a team of coders from Norway. Um, brilliant. Um, I'm, I'm, unfortunately, we have lost a few of them because so they don't live all of them. Um, truly, truly sad. Very, very skilled. Very, very skilled. One of the best we have seen on the platform. Okay, this is absolutely ridiculous. You're not supposed to be able to do this, but they, they do it anyway. So uh, what you see here is is a mix of characters and sprites because what you see on the screen, it's a parallax, fully working parallax. Um, it looks a bit strange here, but okay. Hmm. Yeah, the uh, the overlap doesn't really work as it should because yeah well anyways so it's a mix of characters and sprites um, so they what you see it, it, it's extending into the lower border uh, so that's where you have sprites and then you you see that you would have an overlap between uh, one row and the next so the 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 next row is always sort of overlapping the previous one. At least that's how you see it normally on the screen. But when we see it here frozen, it doesn't appear to be fully like that. Um, if you see the down on the uh, on the very low part here, the the green L is actually overlapping the white P. Or the white P. No. No, it is correct. The the white P should be sort of um, yeah. So the L is proper. You should see the L there. So priorities actually work. Sorry about that. I I, I think this is very neatly implemented. It's it's a very humble implementation of something which is absolutely not technically trivial to implement. So um, and they're just doing a very fancy routine presented very nicely in a humble way. Yeah. Okay, here is bouncing balls. I wouldn't say this is trivial, but this is a lot easier. Uh, they have implemented some sort of bounce, but uh, that sort of natural. And then you see the the character insides, they are sort of bouncing inside the ball. So uh, if you would have something, uh, a character floating inside a ball and the ball would bounce, then the characters would probably bounce as they do here. But they're all scrolling at the same pace, so uh, it's just a matter of uh, bouncing them in, in that direction. And then the... Uh, so the balls, they are characters, and then the... Uh, the, the, the characters inside so the balls are, are characters and then the text is they are they are made out of sprites okay so <laughs> yeah this is <laughs> You can use uh, C64 Debugger to see what is bright and what is characters. And uh, so I, I needed to take a little uh, sneak peek on this. So the, the vertical bars, uh, of course, when they are in the border, they are sprites. But then on the screen, they are characters. So it's not like a sprite bar. It's, it's a mix of sprites and characters. Uh, because w when you are on the screen, uh, they use the sprite for this uh, psychedelic uh, little square instead. This uh, the, the block in the middle, that's also uh, characters. And then you have um, something. It says blue in, uh, 
in sort of a, a, a sprightly, bouncy thing that has lower priorities than, uh, than, than the top layer here. And then the bar that goes vertically inside the middle section, that is a sprite as well. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, <laughs> it, and it looks really nice. And parallax, when it's implemented like that in the middle, that's typically multiple uh, multiple character sets. So you can swap between character sets where you have like the front and the second adjusted. Uh, so you create like a, a scrolling uh, effect. Uh, I would suggest you you read up on uh, how they implemented this in uh, Flimbo's Quest. That's one of the more complex um, parallax scroller games you could find. Um, there is also um, yeah, there is a, there is a video on how that works specifically on Flimbo's Quest, uh, which is this uh, technique of multiple character set for for creating a, a parallax parallax effect. Yeah, this is... I don't know what you call them. It looks like uh, handles for, for exercise or something, but... Uh, changing priorities, so it's... Uh, <laughs> this is a mix. Of course, the, the scroller is, is made out of sprites, so that's sprites. And then the, the, the blue part in the top they are all sprites as well, uh, and uh, it, it's nicely done so they don't overlap, uh, which means that... So it, it's kind of cleverly laid out on the screen. Uh, and then most of the, uh, the vertical bars here, uh, they are characters, but uh, yeah, it's brilliantly laid out and, and also super nicely implemented. And great music, yeah. But now one of my absolute favorite demo parts ever, ever produced. The one that shocked me the most. So the C64 has a limitation of eight sprites. You can have something called multiplexer where you you have like eight, um, an area where you have eight sprites and then you you just change the sprite pointers uh, and, and it can reappear lower and um, so you can make bands of eight sprites, and if you make that dynamically, you, just so you un, so you ensure that you don't have more than eight sprites in any given location, then then it will, you can reuse sprite zero multiple times over the screen and also sprite one. But what you see in the lower border, if you count that, it's not eight, it's nine. So, you would have a VSP, the, the, the graphics is uh, scrolling back and forth using a VSP, that's not, uh, we have seen that before, right? So, so that's nothing special. And the, uh, the top row has uh, a, a multicolor uh, sprite scroller, it's, it's in the uh, border, so it needs to be sprites. And, uh, well, they just ensure that they are doing it uh, nicely by having multiple speeds and multiple colors. And uh, yeah, that's, that's a bit tricky, but uh, it's just administration on how to do that properly. The technically advanced piece is uh, what you see in the lower border. Actually creating a fake sprite. And I can already tell you that the fake sprite is the eye. So the, the one between the M and the C. It looks like a pink sprite, but it's not. So my understanding how this works is that they use the scroll register to create the shape of the eye. So they basically, at the given position there, they open the border by using the scroll register. 
Yeah, it's. If I have a, if I have implemented something like like this, and and uh, given the brilliance I think they ha this has, I would have a picture showing that. Look here, this is where the cool stuff happens. It's uh, this is where the technically advanced stuff sits. But it's so humbly presented that they don't boast it, uh, and and they're not kind of showing off. It's just humbly there. Yeah, one of my favorite demo parts. Mentalic by Panoramic Design, the end part of Mentalic. Okay, that was everything I wanted to present today. So, uh, a set of very nice C64 demos introducing uh, effects that were the first uh, where I saw them. I'm not saying they were the first uh, when the first time they appeared whatsoever, because they had probably been used other places before. There is always this discussion who was first to doing something. So, uh, but these are the introduction of a few of the demo effects that you can still see out there. Now they're not kind of shown off like uh, we have this effect where they build a demo part out of an effect. Now all the effects are sort of components that demo makers are, are introducing to provide the visuals that they want. It's not showing off that they know how to do the effect because everybody can do all the effects. Thank you so much for watching and uh, hope to see you next week on Fairlight TV. Bye bye.